We prepare for significant things. The more significant the thing to us, the more important the preparation that we put in. And whether it's choosing a university or choosing the degree we're going to sit or whether it's preparing for our exams or whether it's choosing someone to spend our life with or, or choosing a home or choosing a career or choosing a good Indian restaurant, the more important the event, the more significant and the more involved the preparation that we put in. And God has put an immense amount of preparation into meeting with you and me. And the reason he's done that is because we really matter to him. God created the universe and made the earth as a meeting place for us and him. It wasn't simply a whim that he created. And it certainly wasn't an accident God purposed and acted and willed and created the universe and created this planet and configured it in such a way that he might meet with us. It's why it's here and it's why we're here. And he creates us in his image for intimacy with him. And he chased us through the corridors of history despite the fact time and time again we turned our backs on him. And preeminently in Jesus, he moves towards us in love. And Jesus carried his own cross to Calvary so that he could carry away our sins. And he sends the Spirit to woo us to him. And this is the grand narrative of God's story and of the world's story. And we are a significant part of that. We're divinely configured to coincide with the narrative of God. And God has acted in countless micro ways, micro moments to meet with you and to be present in your life. You're not an accident. You're not the product of blind chance in infinity. You were willed by God. God prepared from all eternity to be with you, to know you, to love you, and to spend forever with you and put a great deal of preparation into it. And Jesus is always moving towards us. He's always knocking on the door of our lives. He's always turning towards us in love. It was Kierkegaard who said, when I turn to you, you're all already there. You've already turned to me in love. He doesn't turn his back on you. He turns his face and his goodness towards you but so often it is us who turn our back or at least our side to him and we believe that in this season in a particular way the Lord is calling us to turn to him it's always on God's heart and mind it's always his will he always wants people to turn to him but God is calling us again turn to me turn back to me We've turned the church around for 21 years. We faced south, came in there, and we worship facing that way, but we've turned this way. And there to greet us is in the stained glass window is our Lord Jesus with his feet on the earth. And he's there ready to meet us. And some of you may have spent months or even years, as it were, at a distance from the Lord or at an angle from the Lord. And in this season, he's there to meet you and greet you and saying, turn back. Maybe since you went down from university or started that new career, your life has been so crowded that he's got crowded out. And he's saying, turn back 
to me. Let's look at the text. I'm going to make three short points. Firstly, the king is coming. Are you ready or not? In our reading from Luke 3, Luke tells or recalls an ancient prophecy from 700 BC in which Isaiah the prophet foretells the coming of God in Jesus. And the Lord doesn't want us to miss this. So he sends someone to make sure that we're ready for his coming. And then verse 2, speaking about the Son, See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight his paths. In the ancient world, when a king visited, uh, the announcement went out, and the city would prepare, very often a brand new road, so that the king could come easily and quickly. The ease of the royal travel and visit. And they would make crooked roads straight. They would actually remove hills to flatten it out. And they would fill in valleys. And they would clear away the sewage and scare off the bandits and remove the wild animals and so on. To make it easy and quick for the king to come. And that's the image that... Uh, Luke is picking up on here from Isaiah and that is the ministry that marked John the Baptist he was sent to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus a straight and smooth highway for the king many of you will know the trendy road in Chelsea King's Road And it was a two-mile private road built in 1694 for Charles II to ride his horse from his palace to Kew Gardens. It was for his pleasure. You'll know that the road in uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. In the 12th century, King David I saw a small village on a crag called the Burg of Aden. And he decided to put a fortress there. It became Edinburgh. And he built the Via Regis, the King's Highway. It's called today the Royal Mile. These are roads built for the king to get to their pleasure, to get to their home, to get to their castle, to get to their entertainment. But God builds a road to get to us. And we're his pleasure. And we're his delight. And we're the goal. And we're the ones he's coming for. And so John the Baptist, the prophet, is sent to prepare a highway for the king of kings. To prepare people's hearts and to remove obstacles and to get them clean and to make this road straight. There's a fundamental principle here that we consecrate ourselves so that the Lord can do amazing things. It's a verse that comes up repeatedly in the Old Testament. We get ourselves ready and we make the road ready so the Lord can come to us. And I just want to say this morning, St. Aldates, those who are joining us online or listening down the line, the Lord is always moving towards you in love. Some of you may think that you've blown it and he's moved away from you. Not a bit of it. He's saying, turn back, come back. He's moving towards you in love. A few years ago, the main trunk roads into Oxford Centre were at a standstill, the road in front of my house. I wasn't the cause of this problem, as you'll see. And underneath the road was a so-called Fatberg. Not a very pleasant name to give to anyone or nickname. A Fatberg in the drains at Park End Street. Do you remember that? And this huge fatberg that weighed tons and was several meters wide had built up. It was congealed fat that had gone down the sink mixed with nappies and um, cotton wool and stuff that had been flushed down the loo. And the sewer was blocked. The effluent couldn't move. And then it backed up and then it pushed up and then it came through the drains and the drains collapsed and then the road collapsed because of the fat. Fatberg, and then effluent went everywhere. What a dreadful thing. Do you remember that? They had to get these industrial guys in, you know, with huge hoses to, to sort of break down this huge fatberg. 
There was one in uh, somewhere in, uh, along the Thames that was the size of a bus. I mean, foul. It had to be broken down so they could repair the drain, so that everyone could move and they could repair the roads. I was thinking about that last night as it happens. <laughs> like one does. And I was thinking about our lives and what is it that's built up and clogged up and got in the way and caused a backup of all the mess and actually collapsed the road to stop the Lord moving towards us and us moving towards him. I think today the Lord is wanting to challenge us in love, to look at ourselves and to address what's in the way and to remove it by his grace, through his word and his spirit. We can't hose it down, but we can come to him to break down that fatberg in the way, that the road might be repaired, that the Lord might move towards us. Secondly, preparing to meet the king requires repentance. How did John prepare the people? How did he make this highway? Well, not a literal road for the Lord, but a personal one and a spiritual one in people's lives. And it says in verse three, he went into the region of Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He took the people to the river Jordan the River Jordan was really significant in the life of the people of Israel because it demarcated the land of Israel. Still today, it symbolized one of the blue stripes on the Israeli flag. The other one is the Mediterranean. They're the land between these two water masses. And they crossed over, you remember, under Joshua. They crossed the Jordan and enter into the promised land. And so John the Baptist takes them back out to the Jordan. And there's a sense where they're beginning again at the beginning. They've got to go out in order to come back in. They've got, to, they've got to go back to where they, as a people, started. And they've got to cross the Jordan. But it symbolizes washing and cleansing and renewing and being right with God so they can live rightly with God. And they've got to repent and then be baptized. Repentance of sins, it says, for forgiveness. It's dead simple, this biblical equation. If you want to be forgiven, you've got to repent. You want to be forgiven. You've got to say sorry. You've got to be sorry. You've got to do sorry. And you've got to turn away from what you're repenting of. And that internal repentance and getting right with God is symbolized by this external washing. The water that washes away, the running river that carries away, as it were, the, the sin and the stain is what is happening internally. But it must be on the basis of repentance. For whom the bell tolls. Repentance is a religious sounding word but the desire is universal. Every religion is predicated on it. They know there's a God. They know that he's holy. They know that he's good. They know that they're not. They know there's a gulf between them and God. They've got to bridge that gulf. Every religion says work hard, do hard, be good, put effort in, clean yourself up and get to God. But Christianity says you can't. Your best is not good enough. So God's best comes to make us good enough in Christ Jesus and he reaches out. And how do we avail ourselves of that? How do we take it to ourselves what God offers us in Jesus? We simply repent. But we do have to repent. The Brit pop band that some of you will remember, Travis from the late 90s and early 2000s, they produced an amazing anthemic tune back in the day, and it was simply called Turn. And the lyrics went like this. They weren't Christian, but I think that they understood something of the deep things here. I want to see the kingdom come. 
I want to feel forever young. I want to sing. I want to live in a world where I belong. How do we get there? If we turn, 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 then we might learn, learn, learn. One reviewer said of the album, I think it's a brilliant album, they said, and of that particular song, they said they were inane lyrics. <laughs> but three million people bought that album, best-selling album that year, because of that song. And it wasn't just that it was a catchy tune. I think there was something profound that registered with the human condition. And that's why people picked up on it. I want to see the kingdom come. I want to feel that I belong. I want to be released in song. How does this happen? I've got to turn, turn, turn. Repentance is turning, quite simply. That's what the word means in Hebrew. And inter interestingly, the word repent in Hebrew is the 12th most common verb of the Old Testament. It occurs 1,050 times for those who like that sort of stuff. The word is shuv or shub, actually. Don't say be in Hebrew. And it literally means to turn around, to turn back, to return. In the New Testament, in the Greek, it's metanoia, conjunction of two Greek words, meta meaning change, and noia from the word for mind, to change your mind. But it's a, a change of thinking that leads to a change of action. We've got to repent, about face, volta face, about turn and rethink. You cannot face God and sin simultaneously. And if we want to see and meet and greet the Lord who moves towards us, we've got to turn to him who's turned to us first. So forgiveness is dependent on repentance. It's interesting that the first word out of Jesus' mouth when his ministry begins according to Mark's gospel is the word repent. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. I want to see the kingdom come. Turn, turn, turn. Repent is part of the very last thing Jesus said as he ascended and went to heaven. He said forgiveness and repentance of sins will be preached. And it's an active word, not passive. Interesting that Lauren in our worship said, let's not be passive. Let's not be passive in our Christian life. Let's not be passive about these things. Repentance is an active word. We've got to choose to turn, to choose to say sorry, to choose to disassociate and differentiate ourselves from that in our life which is messing us up, those little fat bergs. But actually the word repent, it wasn't growled by John the Baptist, I don't think. It certainly wasn't by Jesus. I think it's a beautiful word and a warm word of invitation Repent. The kingdom of heaven is on offer. Now's your moment. I don't think it's threatening. I don't think it's intimidating. I think it's just a beautiful invitation. And I've been thinking about this repentance of late, turning to the Lord. I got that first. How kind the Lord is. The Lord saying, turn to me, turn to me, turn to me. I said, what a wonderful invitation, Lord. And he says, yeah, now turn from your sin. And then he starts highlighting things in my life. And he's so kind, he doesn't produce a huge long list. I asked my wife this week, I said, Tiff, what do I need to repent of? She said, and she only named one thing. How kind is that? I thought, you lie. That's not enough. But we'll start there. The Lord is so kind. And he just incrementally reveals these things to us. But he's looking at the heart that is willing to turn to him. Let's not hold on to this stuff. Let's not try and go drive around the fatberg and the collapse in the road. Let's not throw up a smoke screens. Let's not justify. Let's not try and modify. Let's confess. Let's ask him, Lord, what's, what's in the way? What is the mess? Ask those who are near and dear to us, what do I need to sort out? And bring it to the Lord who will graciously 
forgive us. If you confess your sins, that's repentance. God is faithful and just. He will forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just like that. Don't have to do something else? Nope. Don't have to bring something? No. Do I have to pay anything? No. Don't I have to do something uber religious? No. Just come and confess and turn. It's almost too simple. It actually offends the religious mind. And then thirdly, repentance. I've only got three points. You're all right. Thirdly, repentance is evidenced by a transformed life. True repentance prepares the highway for the king. And the king comes. There were three lots of people in that reading. We didn't read it all, but if you go on, three lots of people say to John the Baptist, what must we do? There is a consequence to repentance. There is an evidence of repentance. And twice John says, well, go, go now and produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. He says it twice, 3, eight, three nine. Produce fruit. And they say, yeah, but like what? And interesting, the very first thing, and I was reading James this morning, and it's exactly the same sentence as we find here. In 3 verse 9, he says, there's got to be compassion for the poor. It surprised me seeing it there. I probably read that a hundred times. I'd never noticed it before. He says, look, if you've got extra food, give it to those who are hungry. If you've got extra kit, give it to those who are, are barely clothed. There's a pa- practical and demonstrable and tangible evidence of repentance and repentance towards God and turning towards him cashes out in being more compassionate to the needy. What an extraordinary thing. I'm getting right with God and suddenly there's a kind of horizontal effect for good for those who are needy. The test of repentance It's whether we care for the poor. That's one test. And then there's a contrasted life. And he basically talks to the others about walking in the opposite spirit. To the tax collectors, he says, don't rip people off. In those days, tax collectors paid for the right to collect tax. They had to collect a certain amount of tax for the Roman authorities, and anything over that was their own to keep, and they would just put the the screws on people. He says, you collect just what you need. And then to the soldiers, he says, don't you be violent. You're there to uphold justice, not to break justice. And don't lie and be content with your pay. It's really practical. There's something really practical in this Christian living and the evidence of a transformed, repenting life. Repentance is not saying sorry. Repentance is looking different and living different and being different. It comes after being sorry, but it leads to actually a turning away from sin in order to turn to God. It doesn't take place all at once. God is so kind. He doesn't expect perfection of us. He knows what we're like. But as we turn to him and turn back to him and look closer and move closer towards him, he will show more and more things in our life that we need to turn from. I've been a Christian 35 years. I disappoint myself so often. I think, I thought I dealt with that. And then new things crop up. I think, when did that that weed get sown in my soul? And the Lord, though, he never goes, we've dealt with this. Years ago, on my first ordination retreat as a deacon, I confessed a sin to my bishop, or something, in, just before I was ordained. And he said, all right, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and then, a year later, I had another hour with him, and I confessed the same thing. And he rightly said, we talked about that last week, uh, last year. I, yeah, I know, I just... But the Lord never gets edgy with us. He never disappointed. He, never surprised he knows he said oh I'm glad you brought that up the Lord will say I've been meaning to tell you about that the Lord just wants us to be clean and we come to him you've got to come clean in order to get clean repentance President Clinton not often he gets mentioned but this is good one of America's most colorful and some might say capable others wouldn't presidents 
was impeached for serious crimes and misdemeanors. And initially, you'll remember he, when confronted with his sin, he threw up a kind of smoke screen to delay and deny and deflect and all of that stuff. But a year after the exposure of his adultery and his obstruction of justice, that whole Monica Lewinsky affair, you remember, he addressed the White House prayer <coughs> breakfast, September 98. And he gave actually what I think is one of the best descriptions of repentance I ever read, never heard of. I hope it was sincere. I don't know whether it was worked out with a speechwriter, but it was a remarkable thing. I'm going to read it to you because it frames and gives language and form to what I think we need to do. He says, I don't think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. I believe that to be forgiven, more than sorrow is required. There must be genuine repentance, a determination to change and repair breaches of my own making. And I have repented. And second, what my Bible calls a broken spirit, an understanding that I must have God's help to be the person that I want to be. And then Clinton quotes from the, a, a book of prayers that are from Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement um, in the Jewish faith, which happens in late autumn, normally in October, sometimes in September. And he says this, now is the time for turning. Now is the time for turning. The leaves are beginning to turn from green to red to orange. The birds are beginning to turn and are heading once more south. The animals are beginning to turn to store their food for the winter. And leaves and birds and animals turn comes instinctively. But for us, it doesn't come easily. It takes an act of will for us to make a turn. It means breaking old habits. It means admitting we've been wrong. It means losing face. It means starting all over. And this is always painful. It means saying, I am sorry. But unless we turn, we will be trapped forever in yesterday's ways. Lord, help us to turn. The following year, he spoke at the prayer breakfast and he said this, I have been profoundly moved by the pure power of grace, unmerited forgiveness through grace. Whatever we think of him, that's fantastic. And that is true. That is spot on. Look at nature. We're in autumn. Everything's turning and we need to turn to him. And he's there ready to forgive unmerited grace.